uh, a warm welcome to everyone and i would like to invite dr bk singh to uh, open the webinar sir over to you good evening ladies and gentlemen it is uh, my proud privilege to be get associated with such a important uh, and recent topic we at the innovation curious or ic there to be one is not for profit under which we are doing this webinar club meetings and other ones is a knowledge platform we have got a magazine conference and uh, other few things which you can see at the website idea was only creating a platform where we can exchange the views the club members are all big hospitals and organizations like phfi apollo dr lal artemis yashoda hospital and so on and so forth so the people do come and interact on the various topic and bring their views on those we have a community of around 96000 people to which we send our magazine which is the uh, articles which any one of you is interested to publish you do so and this will be a great honor to do and we are the one which is trying to bring all newer concept and understanding to the issues sachin my partner is a double master from european university on cyber security and uh, related subject he has also written chapter in two of my out of the three two of my books he has written chapter on the same issue which is published in usa uh, very interesting when i wanted to publish in, in india uh, the publisher told me that uh, we need money and we will return the money as your book is being sold the us it was not like that and the people got crazy after it published in us and now which has also a inter a indian edition adopted by i am etc this is what when anything which comes from the western world we are the one accepted much better rather than indigenous and that is the one very interesting subject that how you can do your product so if uh, dr sherian is going for our approval in the western side <clears throat> when he gets it in india oh is done from there that's okay so no questions asked if you do it from india then still there are hundreds of questions today's topic anyway is the artificial intelligence i am a doctor by profession by the way i am not a technology fellow but in the company of sachin i have become more technology fellow and has become more medical person so is a good uh, exchange of views which we keep having the artificial intelligence itself is very when i was reading the literature people are saying is it a right name so somebody saying artificial intelligence the people are discussing it should be assisted intelligence it should be added intelligence maybe a uh, word has to change and maybe the name would change in the future but i would like to bring out some issues and pen them down that as a doctor when you see a patient gradually technology is taking over all the duties of the medical and they are one of the person a billionaire from the silicon valley in one of the conference told me that well i don't need any doctor i can get everything done by computer is it so will you like to get yourself done in every critical conditions so all these technology are to assist the medicals but unfortunately what has happened that the people are not only they are totally dependent on doctor doesn't want to touch your pulse and doesn't want to examine you does not want to take your history he immediately says get the blood done get x ray done get the ecg done get this get that well some is it a commercial angle or otherwise he looks at it and he prescribes the medicine that is absolutely wrong the tele medicine could not which i was a part of it which i brought i was one of the the advisor in isro on tele medicine and that is the one initial one when it was brought it to india the government or legal illuminaries were not prepared to recognize it legal issues were there and they are not 
it is all pandemic, the teleconsultation went to some different angle. So you, I would personally and everyone personally, don't lose sight of everyone has his own job to do. And the medical people are totally, if they think it can be done from teleconsultation, it can be done by the application of AI and treat the patient. I think that is not acceptable. I would like to have discussion on those lines as well. Uh, if you really see artificial intelligence, which has been used uh, is in, in a way that you take the lung and find the lesion, and then you can say it could be tubercular, it could be cancer, etc. Now you, it helps the doctor, suppose you have to do survey and the TB when people did all the survey to find out how much TB we have, it will help at least you don't have to look for the normal X-ray, which are segregated by the help of AI. But the lesion, what is there, those ones have to be critically seen and doctor has to give his report, then only it is legal entry. It has been used in cervical uh, cancer, it has used in lungs, it has been used in the spine and hosts of other things. There are some issues which are brought out. Sachin had uh, brought the artificial intelligence in one of the conference by face recognition. He could send your, all the photos to the speaker by evening and which was struggling for days together earlier. And the people could see, ah, this is the play I have already. And now my topic I was discussing, etc. Now these are the, the, the face recognition itself now in some of the states in US is not supposed to be done unless you have taken the consent. So there are some ethical issues. There are legal issues. Take the technology as adjunct factor, additional factor to help you. And that would be really very nice if you do so. Uh, it was started by John. Uh, when the artificial intelligence and it has really come up well and there are many things have been done when and all related when people talk really when I wrote a first book where there's hardly any innovation book and then people was, the buzzword was innovation and you ask them what is innovation what is invention they were totally blank uh, even at the level of IIT where I spoke so now you find that the basics of, I, I've learned myself by reading machine, deep learning, then machine learning, and then artificial intelligence, uh, the driverless, driverless movement of metro in India, car in other places, Alexa, all these are product of artificial intelligence and health, it has a great future as long as it is being used ethically and properly. I, I welcome all the panelists to share their viewpoint. Sachin will conduct it and all the participants who have joined and they are the one who can also ask question answers, also put their view through. We are still in learning phase, but we are in the best era where technology is merging with the medicine more so that most many doctors I know, they have become more technology fellow because they feel in medicine you don't earn much, but here probably you can become a billionaire startup, unicorn, decagon, et cetera. So best of luck on that. And I keep reading about it. In fact, there's a, a recently, I think there's a, some summit on all the unicorn getting connected. And I, I got invited to on that. So they are the ones who are getting collected and putting their point across. So it is the best time for the people because government is very supportive and the government is also a lot of ways to finance. I welcome all of you and I learn myself a lot of things when I attend. So I shall be also attending as one of the participants. Thank you very much. And I hand over to Sachin Gaur. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh... It's a pleasure again uh, to always get uh, a word of caution from you that where we should not lost, uh, be lost with the hype 
in fact uh, the topic for today is uh, actually learning from the real world experts and not something where uh, we are talking from bookish knowledge and i think it's a great pleasure for us and since this session would also be recorded i think for later use uh, i think today we have uh, contributions from some of the best experts in the country and maybe in the world when it comes to using ai in the real world settings so my warm welcome to dr cherian shraddha and uh, we are grateful to you that you could join us we are also joined uh, virtually uh, by rohit uh, and i think three of you represent today the india that we are all proud of i think uh, <clears throat> cure just raised 40 million dollars last week and i think that puts uh, cure.ai into the next level uh, and i think we are all very proud that indian companies are doing uh, a very high quality work and uh, uh, it will be good to learn uh, especially from my perspective i was very much interested to understand that like dr singh mentioned we have created lot of ai products uh, you know in the sense that okay built a face recognition software to send photos to people participating in our conferences so these are small pocs right these are not something which are used by billions of people or where life of somebody is decided but in medical an ai product means serious business it's not like uh, you know something that you hack over the weekend right so of course most startups starting start with some at some point with hacking over the weekend where you have something working but i think it takes uh, a lot of effort to really really uh, make it you know uh, to the clinic and i am grateful again Uh, for these contributions so the way we are going to conduct this uh, uh, online session today we are going to follow a sequence where uh, i have prepared some questions and these questions are mostly in the dimension of trying to understand from these experts that once they have an ai product which is solving a problem what it takes to actually make it successful in the clinical setting so what is the journey and they are going to answer these questions uh, from a technical viewpoint from a viewpoint of also practical hurdles and challenges that they face and hopefully many of you were looking to build ai solutions uh, you would gain from their insights and i think most definitely you will all go back with a strong lesson that uh, you know what are the good uh, practices when looking to build an ai uh, uh, what to say ai solution company uh, in the clinical settings and uh, in order to do that we will start uh, uh, with rohit's video uh, and uh, you will hear from rohit what he has from his perspective and then we'll go to dr cherian and then we'll go to shraddha so over to uh, uh, rohit for everyone to hear what are the practical challenges that cure has faced in building their ai solutions Hi everyone this is Rohit here I'm one of the founding members of Cure and the chief strategy officer really uh, happy to be invited to this week's uh, meet up and definitely looking forward to contribute uh, with whatever little knowledge that I might have on the topic so the idea is that there is a lot of questions that we want to understand and answer in terms of what happens in an on ground scenario right when you're trying to deploy AI on ground what are some of the actual challenges that you come up with right so and today cure we are deploying this almost across 50 plus countries across 500 plus hospitals in uh us uk you know parts of europe africa a lot of it southeast asia a lot of it asian region so there's a lot of uh, variety of uh, geographies that we have deployed in and understood our uh, different technical challenges the idea of the session is just to bring out some of those learnings uh for everyone's benefit right so without further sort of you know i do i'll just quickly jump on to some of the very interesting questions that i am uh, have been asked to answer for this panel so the first question is uh, do we need to expand on data set for training can you elaborate on challenges here 
So yes, uh, data set for training is the most critical thing for any AI company. Uh, at Cure, we are almost crossing close to 4.2 million images for chest X-ray algorithm that we have built, right? Which is the most popular AI algorithm that we have. And that kind of a data is extremely important because uh, if you, honestly, I don't think AI is not something that is, a lot of it is function is, a lot of it is because of algorithms, because the algorithms have become standardized over a period of time. Honestly, what makes difference today is, I think, uh, the amount of data that you use for training, right? Because the more and more data it sees, the more and more accurate it becomes. Obviously, the jump in accuracy from when you are 90% uh, accurate to you know when you become 95 percent accurate with the same amount of data is much lower so obviously as in more the ai becomes more and more accurate um, the delta improvement takes a lot more data but having said that every amount of data does count so the second question is how do we measure the completeness of the data right representation of patient groups as such Again, very important point. And honestly, at this point of time, the more I've understood this topic, I think this very difficult to now actually answer this. I mean, if you had asked me, let's say five years back, I would have given you an easy answer that you know you can just do random sampling or collection from natural data set where patient groups are uniformly represented. And if you do that, you should be able to assume that you have a complete data set. But the more and more I've seen uh, real life problems, it becomes more apparent that a complete data set is a theoretical idea. I don't think you will ever get to a complete um, data set per se. What you do get to is something where you're sort of, uh, you know, data set that are um, large enough to sort of accommodate for every sort of geographical variation, demographic variation, uh, disease variation, you know, seasonal variation. So there's a lot of trains that is there in the data. And honestly, the answer to all of that is just, more and more training data, right? That's what, what I was telling in the previous question, right? That if you collect huge amount of data, you would more likely to be sort of there in terms of completeness of the data, but it's very difficult to theoretically go after the complete or define a theoretical limit of complete data set. Just try and collect uh, unenriched data uh, from as many different settings. And if you keep on doing that for a, over a period of four or five years, I think you will definitely get to a point where it would seem at least practically complete. The next question is ground truth of your training data set. How objective is that? What can you do to improve the quality objective of ground truth? This is again a very interesting question because AI, if you look at from a computer science point of view, AI is very difficult uh, to train if you don't have an objective ground truth, right? All our AI algorithms are trained on that objective reward functions where it's supposed to be, you know, where you have a differentiable loss function and all of that, right? So you definitely need to have an objective function. Whereas if you look at real life, real life reports are, or, you know, ground truths are not really always as objective, right? For example, radiologists, a lot of times, right? In, med, in their reports as, you know, differential diagnosis or sort of, you know, they would make something like a comment like bleed and then they would put something like bracket uh, question mark. Right, so they are themselves not sure, so they put a question mark, which is, and then they would say, please correlate clinically, right? Which means that if a doctor is sort of seeing the patient in real life, uh, then they can obviously judge whether there's actual bleed or not, right? So this is how radiologists in real life hedge their decisions, right? They don't actually, not always sort of take a complete objective ground truth. But if you have to train an AI algorithm, you need one. So how do you solve that problem? What we have done is obviously come up with, um, different mechanisms and you sort of uniform standardizing ground truthing mechanism that way uh, for example every uh, report that is looked at is looked at by a panel of radiologists instead of a single radiologist because that way the ground truth is a lot more robust instead of relying on a single radiologist um, apart from that if you have you know a lot of times the radiologists would refer multiple things uh, like i mean multiple terms for the same uh, finding, right? So if it's a disease, if it's a bleed, they would say bleed, hemorrhage, um, so on and so forth, right? So make a complete NLP, uh, you know, natural language repository of all terms that they would normally use to represent such findings. And that ontology is then you sort of use consistently across multiple disease areas. So just standardizing that process and making multiple, instead of one read or one sort of human read there if you sort of do multiple reads i think that's one way to sort of counter objectivity 
uh, or counter the subjectivity that you would normally get from physicians. Uh, quickly jumping onto the next question, the result that your system provides, are they explainable, interpretable for a clinician? Do you have a method to visualize, explain them in a better in user interface or report? Very interesting question. I think explainability is a very interesting topic. That is a, that's a core of machine learning or AI research as of this point. But if you really ask me, and I thought that explainability was very critical for human leaders, right? I mean, for physicians, when they're building or trusting an AI algorithm, they need to understand why is AI making that decision. And the more and more I've sort of delved on ground and talked to a lot of physicians, it seems like explainability is firstly not that big a factor. Uh, to some extent, I think radiologists already know what it is, right? And they are all sort of just looking for those, you know, those edge cases or stuff like that where they're not very confident. And very few, for example, if you say that there's a bleed in the brain, right? A lot of times, if you just say that, they already would be able to find that where it is, right? They just, they were all, or possibly they already saw that and they were just not confident about it and they needed an AI to help there, right? So a lot of times, uh, firstly, explainability is not that big a factor as, 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 in, as we would normally understand in AI research as such, right? So in AI in healthcare research, explainability is slightly possibly lesser because clinicians already understand where they're coming. I'm, I'm talking about AI in medical imaging at least. Uh, but having said that, in terms of explainability, what we have done is specifically is what I told you earlier, right? That we thought that a clinician, if we are, if, if the AI is saying that there's an opacity in the lungs, then the AI needs to point out where that opacity is, right? It's as simple as that. So every al algorithm that we have or every product that we have built sort of produces that secondary capture uh, in radiology, right? Which is basically the actual image with the overlay of the AI findings on top of that. So which actually points to the which region of the brain or which region of the chest x-ray that it's looking, which it thinks is actually the cause of concern, right? And it marks that out saying that this is the opacity area, this is where it's found the nodule in the lung. So that is very that is very important, we felt. Um, obviously, more and more people are now getting used to AI and imaging. So a lot of them are fairly acquainted with this kind of interfaces and it's a lot more easier for them. So I think, but those, those basic level of explainability is definitely important, I think, uh, for people to understand how the AI is looking at the decision, right? The next thing, question that I have is what happens when the AI and clinicians do not agree on prediction? What happens? Do they give a feedback? Yes. There are a lot of scenarios where AI do not agree with the physicians or, you know, the AI uh, or possibly the physician agrees with the AI, but not on the first read, right? I mean, Possibly they look at something, then they see the AI results, and then they figure out, okay, yeah, possibly there's something that the AI has picked up which they missed. So in those kind of setup, yes, there's there's a discordance that happens. What we definitely use is if if we actually, again, as I said, it's very important to have a very robust ground truth. So just because one radiologist does not agree with one AI output does not mean that the AI is incorrect. So what we need to do in those kind of cases, what we do is basically go for what we call a discordance meeting, right? So every hospital that we deploy, we have this monthly meeting of sorts, which is called the discordance meeting, where we look at all the discordant cases, right? Where one single radiologist did not agree with, let's say, AI. And those cases are accumulated and those are reviewed by a panel. Again, it's important to have a panel look at it because one radiologist can always miss out case or they think they are, could be incorrect, right? So it's important to have the panel review it. And if the panel thinks that there's something, for example, the AI has not picked up or has marked out wrongly, right? It's a false positive or a false negative. In either of those cases, the cases are sort of accumulated over a period of time used for retraining the algorithm. Uh, it's not deployed on the go. I mean, as soon as the AI is learned from the new case, it's the, that newer version of the AI is not deployed because there are a lot of regulatory uh, hurdles. But uh, over from one version release to the next version release, right? One regulatory version release to one next regulatory version release. We sort of collect all these discordant cases, train the AI on that, and then we release uh, all those cases, all the newer version, right? So that's how we sort of do the discordance uh, mapping. Uh, next is how do you bring feedback on the performance of your system in the clinical setting? This is something as I already explained. So there's a proper process in place, which is called a discordance meeting. And there's a post-market surveillance for every CE or FDA regulatory uh, body that you get approval from your algorithms, you have to follow a post-market surveillance where there's sort of a proper survey of all the 
discordant cases and you know cases where the ai did not perform or even where the ai actually performed right whether the sensitivity and the specificity of the algorithm is as per what was declared or what was found to be in the fd or ce studies right it has that ai accuracy not dropped further so that those are very important things that we have to monitor uh in fact what we also do is all the cases that are being read by the ai right there are almost uh, uh close to 20000 exams every day cure algorithms are looking at so subset of those exams every day is also reviewed by a panel of radiologists just to understand um you know if the ai is actually understanding uh is making right decisions or not right so not just sort of doing post market surveillance and all of this um you know sort of discordance meeting but we also sort of take a sample of the exams uh, on our end right every sample uh, a sample of the exams that are read by cure and those are reread just to make sure that the quality is up to mark on a daily basis uh, next question is does your deployment change care pathway is it possible to retrofit your intervention yes uh, it is absolutely possible to retrofit our intervention does it change clinical pathways not really in some places we are seeing that yes it is changing a lot of uh, you know i would say in tuberculosis tuberculosis eradication that's one place where we have been working uh, possibly for the longest time i think that's where we have actually changed we have got a who uh, approval to actually use the cure algorithm uh, in terms of sort of having a direct automated uh, screening right you don't need a human intervention for any of the chest x-ray based uh, screening or triaging for tuberculosis so that's the kind of impact we are sort of striving for where we have completely changed the pathway right that there was a now you can you can have the chest x-ray done uh, the ai automation coming ai reports comes in almost 20 seconds or so as soon as the ai report says it's positive you send the patient for a sputum test or gene expert test right uh, so that's that's something which is revolutionary right earlier this would entire process would take almost good 10 15 days right because there's a radiologist who would have to look at the exam by the time they come back they have to call the patient back and there's like a good 10 15 days that is lost in diagnosing the patient from the first they had the x-ray to their final exam and with this particular way with the who endorsement we have now been able to change that to one hour right patients come in they have their x-ray sees positive within 20 seconds you send them for a sputum test get a result in 40 minutes your entire TB diagnosis is done in that one hour, right? So that's the kind of impact we have done. Uh, but in some of the other places, for example, in uh, uh, some of the other countries where we are working on other disease areas, we are not actively changing the protocol as of so far. Uh, the AI is sort of in those places also acting as an independent decision maker. Uh, I mean, sorry, is an um, augmented decision maker, right? So it's basically augmenting the decision of the physician or the radiologist to make more accurate decisions. So there are those, both the sides, right? The places where we have changed some protocols and places we haven't. And we see places where we have changed protocol that required a lot more uh, clinical evidence, a lot of work with WHO to actually change those protocols. Uh, whereas in some of the other places, it's, it's acting as a decision support. So in that case, it's much easier. Okay, I think it's almost close to the end. So I'll just quickly wrap up with the last question. What does your system bring to... A uh, clinical process, for example, improving quality of decision making, clinical system automation of manual process, something else. Uh, in your opinion, clinicians perceive the gains to the extent you foresee. So, what can you do to build consensus on the impact? Uh, so, yeah, I think in terms of impact, what we have been doing is a lot of is uh, you know actually improving patient outcomes. That's that's the core of what all of us are trying to do here. But uh, that happens in a lot of ways. I think one part is obviously improving. Um, you know, the workload and the manual labor that normally radiologists or physicians have to put in, in terms of detecting, right? I mean, a lot of manual labor goes into sort of looking at a lot of normal chest x-rays. So can the AI just take off that workload? That's that's honestly one of our very big use cases at Cure. Uh, sort of reducing the workload, improving turnaround times for radiologists so that they can report scans much quicker and more accurately. Apart from that, a lot of that also improves, for example, in better or earlier diagnosis of patients, right? So for example, in lung cancer, uh, we have been working in almost close to 30 plus countries where we are trying to detect early lung cancer in stage one or stage two, as opposed to what is done in stage three or four as of today. Uh, so there's obviously that kind of an impact as well that we are trying to do in better 
uh, diagnosis of patient, earlier care. Um, there's also timely care, right? It's one is obviously earlier detection, and then there is timely care. Uh, timely care is, for example, in stroke patients, can you sort of help AI do a quicker intervention, right? A thrombolysis or a thrombectomy being done then and there. So that's the kind of impact that we are sort of creating, I mean, which is a combination of all the things, right? It's reducing workload as well as improving patient outcomes and earlier detections. And uh, yeah, I think in terms of consensus on the impact, there is definitely a lot of consensus that we are seeing now. As the AI ecosystem matures over a period of time, I think there's a lot of consensus that is getting built out in terms of what the AI is actually able to achieve. I think there's, there's definitely a sign of the times in terms of what's possibly going to come next. And we definitely think there's a lot of maturity, more and more maturity coming into the ecosystem, people trying to understand what AI can do more for them. So there's definitely a lot more improvement. If we are, I think, honestly, we are scratching the surface as of today. This is just a lot more to be uncovered in AI in healthcare in the next few years. And yeah, with that, I'll sort of end the session. All the best to everyone out here who's attending. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter if you have any questions. Thank you. Yeah, so I think Dr. Cherian and Shraddha, both of you would agree this was a, like a fabulous response from Rohit. And it also kind of gives you uh, something to build upon. So without further ado, let me invite Dr. Cherian uh, to continue on this. And uh, uh, maybe you could say first few words uh, about the exact problem that you're solving. And I think it's also worth noting that all three of you are dealing with chest X-rays in one way or another. So some, uh, I would say that AI is coming faster in the radiology space uh, than we can imagine. And I think we are all uh, grateful that Somehow it's coincidental that all three of you are uh, attacking the uh, medical imaging domain, but with different, uh, for solving different problems. So over to you, Dr. Chen. Thank you, Sachin. Uh, you were right, uh, uh, Rohit, uh, Rohit's session was really uh, very informative and leaves very little to build on, but yes, there are some points I would like to talk about, but first, uh, a brief introduction on my part. I'm uh, Dr. Cherian. I have uh, completed my medical education from AIMS and post that I have uh, ventured into entrepreneurship field for uh, uh, like more than uh, seven, eight years now. And uh, at Synapsica, I'm leading all the conceptualization, design, implementation of all the medical products, how, how uh, to go about solving a problem, and uh, choosing the problem, solving the problem, deploying it, and taking feedback and improving that's that's my goal at Synapsica. What we were what we are building at Synapsica is we have a couple of AI algorithms. One uh, such as mentioned was uh, uh, assistant on chest X-ray, but a more unique and a niche product that we are building are uh, AI algorithms that read spine imaging and improve the efficiency of radiologists. Uh, in reading those cases and bringing more object objectivity and quantification to these uh, interpretations. So uh, to uh, uh, to the uh, set of questions that were shared and uh, probably the chronology of questions in which Rohit answered, I'll take them in that sequence. And uh, uh, Rohit did mention that data is more important than algorithm and uh, uh, I, I would like to slightly differ here uh, from Rohit. Uh, data definitely is more important and every AI company is hungry for data because uh, like as Rohit mentioned, plugging in data would definitely lead to improvement in that algorithm and that last mile journey of like going from 90% to 95% accuracy uh, is, is, is tough and takes the longest amount of time. But the way we approach it is uh, that uh, uh, and it, it, it somewhat resonates with the idea Dr. V.K. Singh said earlier that uh, AI is like any other tech. It, uh, it, has, it is continuously improving and there is always scope for uh, improvement. But when we start to build a tech, what we do is we define a scope of the product and what's the intended use uh, um, to which the AI would be put to and what do we expect out of it. 
it's like any tech product uh, when you start building you have to define these things and um, the current version of our spine reading algorithms which are designed for objectivity and bringing efficiency to the reading and interpretation workflow are, are trained on more than 75,000 images and 75,000 exams of MRI spine connected over from like multiple uh, multiple sources acquired through various different machines. So these algorithms are like in currently deployable stage and uh, and and we uh, and are ready to be deployed. But how do we reach that decision? Is when coming back to the point that when we started, we clearly have a we had a defined objective that hey we want to reach here and uh, we need to walk that fine balance of inputting more data into the ai and uh, not, and uh, and not forgetting about what we want to achieve so all of the data that uh, uh, we have currently is sufficient for uh, the goal that we have set out for us um, obviously we would uh, want to have more data and expand our data set to develop more uh, more uh, features and more capabilities to our AI, improve the existing capabilities that we have, and uh, and and, and uh, coming to the challenges of expanding the data set, I think we have covered most of them. One thing uh, that I would like to point out to the uh, audience of who would, uh, as Sachin mentioned, who can take uh, take away these feedback and maybe uh, use it to uh, refine their own processes in AI building and. To other audience maybe to understand better how an AI company thinks is uh, is is an internal issue and uh, and uh, what happens is it's not about just acquiring more data the data itself costs a lot to be input into the system I'm not talking about sourcing but the data preparation the uh, objective ground truthing of the data cleaning and understanding how it will change your AI system that itself is a very costly process and not just on, only in uh, terms of money, in terms of time. Uh, and, uh, and and you need to walk a fine balance between what we do want to achieve uh, in, in sync with the goal and uh, uh, in sync with the goal and intention which you started out with and how much data you want to input into the system. So that fine balance is required to be very cash efficient and cash prudent uh, in terms of uh, in, in, talking from a business standpoint and also from a medical standpoint, plugging in more data doesn't necessarily mean that improve, there will be improvement in performance of AI. That is where I differ uh, uh, with uh, Rohit in the first place that uh, uh, Rohit mentioned that if you plug in more data, the improvement will be you can see the improvement going up but that's not the case even after a certain amount of data being plugged into the system the system just stops learning and uh, there comes in the there comes in the uh, the skill of the team the, uh, the core uh, cap capability of the team wherein you can build newer algorithms uh, and newer uh, innovations bring in newer innovations in technology that can leverage that learning from uh, the additional data set and bring uh, and, and develop more uh, more accurate algorithms. So, uh, like I have read a, uh, a formula written by someone, I, I, and, and we internally believe it to be true and follow it. So, like the accuracy of AI algorithm is um, is um, is the quality of your neural network multiplied by data square. So, obviously, data is is um, a two-fold factor here, but yes, quality of algorithm is something which uh, which definitely impacts the end output, and there is a lot of scope that we can do there, and that's where our primary research is focused. So, uh, moving on to the next question um, of how do you measure a completeness of data set? There, I completely agree with Rohit that there is like no clear way to measure the completeness of data set what you can do instead is again going back to the intended use and the scope of your tech product if you have clearly defined scope so for example with our products when we set out we wanted to bring in uh, so generally a radiologist would take taking example of mri spine radiologist would take anywhere between 10 to 15 minutes to completely uh, read the mri spine exam we wanted to reduce that time 
from 15 minutes to 5 minutes and uh, that was our initial goal uh, setting out uh, uh, and uh, uh, we measured the completeness of the data set in that context and uh, we, we think our data set is complete when we are able to actually achieve that and uh, to that I would say that uh, a real time uh, uh, clinical setting uh, uh, trial is the only way to say whether your AI is performing well enough on the data it has been trained and that indirectly means that your data set is complete. Uh, moving on uh, to the next question that's how do you make uh, how do you ensure objectivity in ground that's really really a very a very very uh, important questions for startups and businesses who are working on ai and uh, rohit captured it uh, very succinctly that uh, in, in a real life scenario there is a lot of subjectivity and inter observability that happens uh, between radiologists while reading the exams and uh, what you can do is uh, is you know go to go through multiple rounds of uh, annotation that's same we do here at Synapsica. We go through multiple rounds of annotation, take consensus among multiple rounds to achieve an objective ground truth. Because like uh, to take a crude analogy here is that AI is like a dumb kid. And, and uh, you, you, uh, if you want that dumb kid to excel in clinical trials, wherein it is tested against multiple radiologists, you would have to handhold the AI to learn from multiple radiologists rather than a single radiologist and then uh, be benchmarked against uh, ground truths given by multiple radiologists. So that is one uh, fairly straightforward way of bringing objectivity into the ground truth that gets fed into the AI system. But uh, second, and I think uh, 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 that is uh, a way we have defined our products. The second is, I think the approach that you can take to uh, prepare your data and ground truth also helps uh, a lot in bringing the objectivity. So uh, uh, what we do is, uh, so what, uh, what we have observed is generally that if, if there is no limitation on skill, then the observation that uh, a specialist would make while looking at the images are fairly consistent. It is the interpretation of those observations where the variability comes in. So if, for example, if you see um, uh, a, a lesion or, or, or maybe a shadow uh, or some artifact in the image, everybody is able to see that. Everybody is able to see that, but what you make of that artifact, whether it is, you know, uh, uh, lung cancer or TB uh, or maybe something else, that interpretation uh, is generally uh, very subjective and has variability. So uh, how we want to, how we have uh, thought of approaching this is, why don't we go towards uh, identifying the observations themselves rather than uh, predictions. And when, uh, so, uh, when we go after those observations, picking out observations is fairly, fairly uh, objective when uh, one looks at the images. Uh, people are uh, able to look at the image and identify, hey, there is, uh, there, there is this description and then use that description uh, in context of existing medical criteria to come up with interpretation. So, uh, and so what uh, happens is you have a good objective ground truth evaluated against uh, medical, uh, established medical criteria to give out the final interpretation. And uh, this also helps uh, uh, in, in creating a more explainable AI. So uh, 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 a radiologist or specialist looking at the images and as well as the results of AI would know, hey, these are the observations that were captured. And uh, on the basis of this, this is the result that AI has given. Even if the AI has made a mistake, they know that which observation was uh, interpreted or which observation was picked up wrong and because of which the final interpretation is incorrect. So uh, that is a second way we are tackling uh, objectivity in ground truth, changing the approach to behave more like humans rather than uh, being a black box and just uh, uh, predicting 
getting something uh, from raw images. Obviously, there's a trade-off in this, and uh, and uh, we are we are aware of that trade-off and have made a conscious decision. The trade-off is that when we when you input only observations from human, the AI is not able to learn from things that a human eye cannot see. There are a lot of uh, correlations and a lot of uh, hidden features that impact the uh, impact different weights and biases of different uh, impacts different weights and biases at different decision making points which finally might lead to ai being better than human but that's a trade off of developing a more objective ground truth and having an explainable ai and i think uh, that uh, covers the uh, some part of the next question of of the results that our system provide are they explainable or interpretable for a clinician uh, uh, guess again uh, objective observation uh, being output um, uh, being the output of ai and uh, is uh, is forms the basis of being the uh, forms the basis of uh, uh, overall output given by AI systems being more explainable and understandable by the radiologists. And uh, again, uh, as Rohit mentioned that uh, this is uh, this AI, the format of AI outputs becoming fairly common and radiologists are getting used to. So uh, it's always best to go go after what's most sought of what what most common and not reinventing the wheel. So most of the AI companies what they're doing is uh, they are preparing annotated images highlighting certain areas masking masking pathologies so that uh, radiologists are able to see localize and understand what what the problem is and apart from providing annotated images what we do is we give uh, a feature of interactivity to the radiologists and uh, that is uh, uh, that we think is important because not all results of ai are going to be accurate all of the time and if we are to make a true assistant to a radiologist then uh, there must be some way for radiologists to interact with the results of ai uh, we think of radiologists like internally we think of radiologists of uh, sorry we think of ai as being a junior radiologist in training who prepares a report and then a senior radiologist looks at the report and makes changes and uh, with the interactive tool what we want to do is uh, make that process of making corrections on the results of the junior radiologist much more easy. And, uh, and in the process, what happens is if the radiologists interact with the AI and change their results, we immediately get a feedback uh, that, uh, hey, uh, the results of AI in this uh, flow was changed, so there must be some problem, and that gets taken into the feedback cycle, all of such images, all of such cases and pathologies where changes were made are uh, collated automatically and uh, and, and, auto, uh, and uh, collated automatically and categorized because you already know for what reason the changes were made and we are able to assess where we are going wrong and what areas need to be improved and uh, and, and, uh, and it gives us a food for thought and next action items on how to go about improving our images from the interaction results from the uh, with the interaction results from the radiologists. So I think yeah, uh, uh, that answers the next question as well as to how we are taking on the uh, uh, how the AI system is taking on the clinician feedback and how we are improving on it. So it kind of uh, gets automatically done through the interactive feature we have. And, uh, and that information that we get, get improves the performance of AI going forward. And uh, going on to the next question, uh, that is, uh, how does your deployment change the care pathway? Uh, and is it possible to retrofit? Yes, the uh, uh, system is able to retrofit and integrate with existing workflow. Uh, and, and that was our, one of our main concerns. That we, the radiologist should not be able should not be switching to different systems while looking at uh, the results of AI because all any or all efficiency that is gained from AI will be lost in uh, you know switching between systems and looking at various panels to interpret and 
uh, and, and a clear a clear and tight integration with the existing workflow is important and it's possible to retrofit our solutions but to the answer of changing the care pathway i think the first in the first step most of the ai solutions will uh, most of the ai solutions will improve the efficiency of the existing pathway and in the next step possibly go on to changing the uh, changing the uh, overall clinical care pathway that there is uh, obviously the difference being uh, some of the screening uh, exams like mammogram screening or ct lung screening wherein uh, a cancer needs to be picked up and there a bulk of volume can be processed by ai and it can really change the care pathway but uh, those are things which are in early early stages, very promising, but early stages, and that will definitely come. Uh, to the last question, I think, uh, how does your system bring efficiency into the clinical process? Uh, and if does it improve quality of decision making, automation, etc.? So, what our system, uh, our, our AI, is able to do is that uh, one, it focuses, as I said earlier, it focuses on improving the efficiency of radiologists in reading and interpreting the spine exam. That's our main focus. And there we are able to, uh, we are able to reach our goal uh, to reduce that 15 minutes time taken to five minutes, seven minutes uh, for routine cases by radiologists. And, uh, and, and what it involves is it involves a lot of automation on the manual processes which a radiologist would generally spend while reading such exams and uh, and 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 if you if you ask a radiologist like uh, nobody wants to read a spine exam just because you know they are tedious laborious because it involves a lot of manual work and we think that uh, helping uh, radiologists with uh, uh, a drudge work like this would also impact the burnout uh, which happens among specialists and which is very true for radiologists. A lot of radiologists, almost 50, 60 percent of radiologists feel burnt out uh, at least one point in their career, in at, least, uh, at, at least one point of time in their career. And uh, removing that manual and tedious process will help that. The second thing uh, which impacts the uh, patient outcomes is uh, AI is able to increase the sensitivity of a lot of pathologies that are uh, present in MRI spine gets missed uh, uh, by a reading radiologist. For example, uh, if, for example, uh, there are studies that say that almost up to 30% of osteoporotic fractures are missed in MRI spine and uh, they are not picked up in early stages. And, when they are picked up at late stages, either the uh, either the patient has suffered a lot of pain during that period, or due to uh, or the treatment is delayed, which might lead to more costly and more invasive procedures. And uh, if we are able to pick up, uh, increase the sensitivity of picking up these pathologies using AI, that's going to help a lot of patients uh, along the way. Wrapping up, I think uh, uh, just finishing on my time. So uh, to the last question, uh, these are the values that I have spoken about, but do clinicians perceive the gain to the extent you foresee and what can you do to build the consensus on the impact? So here, uh, building consensus is, is, uh, is a difficult thing, uh, especially when uh, taken in the context of that radiologist who are used to working in a way for a long, long time. Their complete training was uh, complete training was done in a different way. Now, when they have resumed work and have, have worked for a long amount of time, you come in with AI and ask them to change their behaviors of how they work. That that is the most challenging part. I think uh, that's there. So. Uh, one thing that you can do is that you can have established proof of accuracy of your products that's going to inspire some confidence uh, with the specialists to use that product. And the second thing that I mentioned about, uh, the second thing that is, uh, is focus on usability. So here again, repeating about our uh, approach of 
making the AI interactive because I think that's the most important point wherein your product is very, very tightly and seamlessly integrated into the workflow and they are able to interact and uh, interact with the AI results and generate reports very quickly that actually uh, and actually see benefit in it, benefit in it. That is the uh, most important part. I think uh, as a company, we are realizing that usability is almost as good as if not more important than accuracy in clinical scenarios. And, uh, and, uh, and to the big pilots that we are doing, wherein we have deployed it like uh, with uh, a very large organization, I think nothing you ever say, do, or show will uh, will prove it unless you demonstrate it and uh, demonstrate like demonstration in their actual practices and demonstration or actual demonstration of how it helps them in their uh, daily uh, in their daily interpretation and their business improving their financial metrics that is something which is gonna bring in the consensus to adopt uh, the AI model. So yeah I think that's all from my side Sachin. Yeah thank you thank you for sharing uh, more light on this topic and also good that you could disagree also with uh, Rohit on some points. So I think that makes a good discussion but I also wonder that maybe it makes the job more difficult for Shraddha because a lot has been spoken now on this topic. So, uh, but I understand that with Carpal, you guys are not looking at a product, uh, but you are a platform. And I think that makes it even more uh, important for you to scrutinize uh, the uh, solution that you want to bring on board. Because an individual technician may not have developed set criteria to evaluate an AI solution, but you as a company, as a platform company, may definitely have to, you know, uh, you know, put your credibility at stake when you introduce an AI solution to your portfolio. So we look forward to hear from you, Shrata, and I think you can throw more light on these questions. So uh, welcome again. Thank you, thanks, Sachin. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shetian, for such a comprehensive uh, uh, speech on uh, how you are trying to develop uh, very high, highly accurate AI solutions. So hi everyone. Uh, so in interest of time, I think I'll spend uh, next uh, 10 minutes, uh, you know, discussing while there are uh, such amazing um, AI solutions developed by Synapse, uh, the Spine MR solution and uh, uh, Cure's uh, chest X-ray and head CT solutions. Uh, while, while uh, you know, the AI development uh, life cycle was very comprehensively covered by both Dr. Sherian and uh, uh, Rohit, uh, I would like to address uh, a few uh, uh, challenges and, and, and throw light on what are the challenges that we face on a daily basis when it comes to deploying these AI solutions in real uh, world uh, clinical workflow. So as uh, uh, Sachin just uh, mentioned, at uh, carpal.ai, we are uh, working towards uh, serving as a single enablement layer that uh, allows healthcare providers access uh, to the best uh, AI in medical imaging solutions worldwide, and also ensuring seamless integration of these AI solutions into their day-to-day -day, uh, imaging workflow. So, uh, as uh, so as uh, you know, uh, Dr. Sherian's uh, synapse solution and uh, uh, you know, Rohit's uh, uh, the chest X-ray solution, we have uh, some, like we have these solutions already integrated on the model, and uh, we are uh, in fact uh, in the process of uh, deploying uh, these uh, solutions uh, across uh, our partner hospital sites worldwide. So, Carpal is uh, is is uh, deployed at uh, multiple locations across different continents. Uh, we are uh, uh, deployed at uh, academic uh, centers in the US uh, at Thomas Jefferson University. Uh, we are working with uh, the Stanford Amy Center. Uh, we are also very actively working with Mass General Hospitals and uh, other uh, locations in the US. In Brazil also, we are very, very actively uh, deployed uh, at uh, Albert Einstein Hospital, uh, CD and DASA uh, 
uh, diagnostic chains. And uh, right now, uh, we are also uh, deploying our solutions, our body solutions at this case. So at uh, IMED in Australia, along with other uh, imaging uh, centers worldwide. So in India, of course, uh, uh, we are uh, deployed at Manipal hospitals and uh, uh, Mahajan uh, diagnostic chain. And uh, we are constantly on the lookout for uh, more uh, healthcare providers to collaborate with. So uh, yes, uh, I think uh, I'll quickly highlight uh, what are the key challenges uh, that Carpel addresses. So basically, long story short, uh, we know that, that there are multiple AI solutions out there in the market, right? And they are all equally good. And uh, but the key challenge when when it comes to deploying these solutions is that healthcare providers do not know a the existence of these AI solutions, and B, they do not know how to access and adopt these AI solutions into their day-to-day uh, -day workplace. So these are the two main challenges that we at Carpel are precisely uh, trying to address. And uh, this is a daily, uh, this, is, this is precisely what our uh, uh, objective is, and this is what all our energy and efforts go into. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you a quick, uh, uh, what is the uh, life cycle? Uh, that uh, uh, Carpel uh, tries to uh, uh, follow when it comes to successfully deploying uh, AI solutions uh, into uh, me medical imaging workflows at hospitals. And uh, how is it that we are trying to add value to both AI developers and healthcare providers in this entire ecosystem? So uh, as you, I, I, I'm sure everybody is already aware that uh, one major challenge uh, when it comes to deploying an AI solution into hospital ecosystem is the IT infrastructure that uh, one needs to get past. So uh, from our experience uh, over the past year, there are multiple levels of review that uh, an AI solution or a software vendor uh, will have to go through before they can even run a POC uh, to deploy and test uh, their AI solution uh, live at the hospital site. So we at Carpel uh, tend to cut this entire uh, timeline and uh, we our, our, our collaboration with AI partners is such that we would you know want them to focus on integrating their solution onto a, onto the carpal platform and that also we try to facilitate uh, as uh, quickly as possible uh, it is ideally a single point integration and uh, it does not it, it, it can take uh, from maybe 16 to 24 hours to integrate maybe Synaptica's spindle lumbar, uh, lumbar spine MR solution into Carpel. And uh, then from that point onwards, it is our uh, job to take that solution to as many hospital sites across the world. So exactly from this point onwards, we will facilitate integration of that AI solution into a hospital. We will figure out what is the right uh, uh, IT setup uh, that we need to get past. If there is any security review uh, uh, that uh, we need to uh, uh, go through. And uh, so basically uh, what Carpel does is it, it allows AI developers uh, basically focus on developing more robust solutions and the deployment aspect of taking those solutions from bench to clinic is Carpel's. So we are basically acting as uh, uh, the enablement layer and uh, we would want the hospitals to have access to as many uh, robust AI solutions out there in the market and vice versa. We would also want the AI companies to have access to as many hospital sites across the world to deploy their solutions and real world feedback as to how they are performing and where are the white spaces. So yes, uh, I think uh, that is pretty much about what Carpel does. And uh, I think uh, uh, a few more things that we are currently working on, uh, which, uh, which you know, we are also learning in real time, is that uh, how uh, Carpel can also serve as uh, a single interface uh, to give feedback from uh, the clinical world to AI developers and, uh, you know, kind of uh, frame that, uh, uh, path of uh, gathering uh, uh, real-time feedback and you know that that could serve as very valuable like valuable data for AI developers to further uh, build upon some more features and 
incorporate uh, those uh, inputs uh, from doctors uh, from their day-to-day -day, uh, interactions with these AI solutions. So uh, yes, I think uh, that is pretty much what uh, Carpal is currently focused on. Uh, when it comes to onboarding AI solutions, as uh, Sachin had mentioned, yes, absolutely, uh, Sachin, uh, we are constantly on a lookout for uh, solutions with high accuracy, uh, uh, preferably uh, solutions with FDA and CE approvals. Having said that, uh, it is not a prerequisite uh, to come on Carpal because that is also one area that we assist AI companies with. So uh, we help AI companies run clinical trials for FDA approvals and CE approvals. So we that is a different uh, vertical that Carpal uh, helps AI companies with. So we have helped uh, uh, some like we have helped uh, some chest X-ray uh, companies in the past to get FDA approvals, and there are a, there are multiple clinical trials that are currently underway. Uh, so yes, uh, Carpal can. Uh, serve again as you know a single point interface for any ai company to get those regulatory approvals so as you know you know it's not a simple it's not a simple task it's not a day's task it, it, it requires multiple resources and it requires a platform where uh, ground truthers can uh, do annotations where uh, data can be collated and uh, uh, you know you require domain expertise so all of these aspects are uh, once again um, taken care of by uh, carpal and uh, so we run, we try and run both pilot and pivotal studies for AI companies to get uh, FDA and CE approvals. In fact, now we are also uh, beginning to work for uh, TGA approvals and LG uh, PD approvals uh, for Australia and Brazil respectively. So that is how we are constantly expanding into that domain along with ensuring that these AI solutions are uh, deployed across all of our partner hospitals. So yes, uh, I, I think uh, that is what uh, our uh, ultimate focus is. Uh, Sachin, is, uh, is there any, I'm happy to answer any questions if any. Yeah, I, I appreciate uh, what you have shared, Shraddha, and I would appreciate further a bit more scrutiny. You know, it seems like uh, right now, uh, the path seems very straightforward. There's an AI company and you will bring them on board. And uh, of course, uh, delegating the decision uh, to an FDA or a C approval as a you know seal of trust is probably a low hanging fruit. But you also mentioned that you adopt companies early on to the pipeline. I think uh, the kind of questions I shared with Dr. Cherian and Rohit, they were mostly uh, kind of trying to understand what brings trustworthiness uh, to an AI system and what makes AI system more acceptable by clinicians. Uh, I think where Dr. Singh started from a speculative approach uh, where this kind of technology is fit for the clinical setting or not. So, of course, you guys are in the center of it and maybe in your minds, you know, the time of it has already arrived, but I think there is still, you know, some distance to cover. So let me, you know, stretch your minds, you know, a bit more uh, on this topic. And I don't want to let it go easy because there needs some scrutiny a bit more. So I asked this question to Rohit and uh, I think Dr. Cherin also responded about data. And I think what is happening these days is that people buy AI models and they deploy them in a setting like a clinical setting and they don't know it's a black box for them. So for, at times they do not know how many uh, images it has been trained on, what was the demography of those uh, patients on which it was built. So Google has proposed last year a new approach. It's called model card. So when we buy a medicine from the store, we can actually look at the label of the medicine and we can see what is the salt composition. And the medicine can say, this is the allergy. So don't give it to a pregnant woman or, you know, because in the clinical trial, pregnant woman was not part of the, med when the medicine was designed. So in your eyes, in your perspective, when a model is being deployed on the ground, such labeling 
is it available yes no maybe or are you guys working on it so that's my first question to both of you so uh, i'll take that uh, first uh, uh, sachin so such labeling so i think uh, in in, uh, in the discussion i mentioned that what is most important uh, for the practices is that they see a direct demonstration of these benefits of or on the claims that the ai products make whether they hold true or they don't hold true and uh, and and what is the benchmark against uh, uh, what is the what is the actual thing that is that is getting benchmarked so uh, the medicine analogy probably is not very accurate because it is a salt composition it was tested on uh, pregnant ladies or not tested on pregnant ladies uh, Rather, I think uh, what happens in AI is is uh, a retrospective analysis rather than uh, the importance of retrospective analysis rather than what went into training the AI. Maybe pregnant ladies' data didn't go into training the AI, but it performs wonderfully on pregnant women. So that is what is more important than uh, uh, what was input into the system. So a large uh, randomized controlled trial a large clinical research is something definitely that will inspire confidence uh, into and building trust with radiologists as i mentioned and and that large randomized controlled trial can have different and it generally does a good research generally does it divides the uh, uh, data set into various age groups into various ethnicities various geographical locations various type of diseases in uh, in fact and then comes up with a hey, these are the categories where AI is as good as radiologist AI is better than radiologist AI is poorer than radiologist. So uh, that uh, retrospective large randomized clinical trials are something that will build confidence. This this uh, pushes me to share a recent uh, clinical trial that we did with our product. Like there were interesting results. So just wanted to share quickly what happened was that. Uh, the results of AI were presented to radiologists and they were asked to make corrections in them. So if the radiologist knew that this was given by, by AI, they made more corrections. If the same results were given, that, uh, given in the garb of a report prepared by another radiologist, they made lesser corrections. So uh, to this, I think, uh, to answer your question, an inherent form of doubt comes just from the results being output by a technology. And, uh, and, and the same thing if it is given by human because of the variability, hey, it, it looks all right. Uh, the interpretation looks all right. That is the uh, justification uh, loop that the mind goes into. So uh, yes, uh, to answer your question, uh, large retrospective clinical trials would be important. But uh, to add on that, uh, direct demonstration for each practices as to how useful the AI is for them in their routine practice is something which uh, which value is more than uh, anything else. Shada. Yes, so uh, Sachin, in fact, thanks for bringing this up because uh, that is precisely a standard prerequisite that we also follow uh, prior to actually taking uh, an AI solution and deploying it live uh, at a at a hospital site, so we 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 run a, a POC uh, on a retrospective data. So Carful does uh, have a validation and monitoring modules that allow us to test uh, that uh, solution. Uh, now that could be tested either on uh, uh, preferably on data sets uh, from the target hospital site with pre-established ground truth. And uh, Carpel's validation and monitoring uh, modules uh, uh, can give an indication on what is the performance of that AI solution on data sets from uh, that particular hospital site. So this is very much a concern. And uh, we definitely have uh, some basic uh, performance standards that we take into consideration before full pledgedly uh, deploying the solution uh, into clinical workflows. In fact, not just uh, prior to deploying uh, the solution uh, into hospital uh, systems, we also 
uh, performance uh, form post deployment monitoring uh, of uh, these AI solutions once they are live. And uh, we try to gather feedback from radiologists. And uh, yes, as uh, I think someone had mentioned, uh, the post market surveillance uh, is uh, very much uh, valid. And it is very, very important because we take that feedback from uh, uh, the hospitals and we try to pass it on uh, to the AI developers. So that two-way communication is very, very important. And it does not uh, end uh, at the point of, uh, you know, uh, onboarding an AI solution and just uh, deploying it at a hospital site. So uh, performing a, a proof of concepts on retrospective data and also ensuring that uh, post-deployment uh, monitoring is carried out and followed by feedback passed on to AI developers is what uh, the ultimate um, AI deployment life cycle is supposed to be. <clears throat> Definitely. Uh, but I, in my personal opinion, I think we still need to uh, you know, push the boundaries here a bit. And uh, while Dr. Cherian does not agree with the medicine analogy here, but uh, let me quote another example. So here in Norway, where I am right now, uh, when the COVID vaccine was given to the elderly people, immediately, I think, you know, a few dozen elderly people died. And then they realized that uh, the medicine was, the vaccine was not tested on people above 60 years. So that is the gap of information which creates loss of life. So if the medical authority regulators would have known that the vaccine was not given to people above 60, you know, people would not have died. And then they ended up revising the protocol. They said anybody who is above 85 should not take the vaccine here in Norway because, you know, if you are going to die by taking vaccine, it is better than, you know, dying by COVID. So sometimes these gaps do get created. And my uh, only submission here is that sometimes we need to report the data. And that data, should be reported like the way medicine labels are developed so that buying or procuring or deploying AI becomes an objective decision rather than just outsourcing it to a seal of trust, whether it is a CE marked or FDA. But we can make more educated decisions that it was tested on Caucasians, it was not tested on Indian. It may work out fine, but yes, this is something we need to do. So there's more of a remark, uh, you know, I, I want to move into second question because time is limited. So sorry, uh, but I'll keep trying to disagree or, you know, build. A, most a welcome, Sajid. Yes, most welcome. <clears throat> so the, the other aspect that I see strongly here in the Nordics is that, or at least in the EU, that people want to build trust for the solutions. And I was interacting with one professor and she was very worried that when decision making is automated and people either may start trusting that AI solution, like you said, junior uh, uh, resident or junior radiologist, you know, is preparing the report and the senior is agreeing, right? So at one instance, you know, imagine a scenario, there's a radiologist in a hospital and finds, okay, eight out of 10 times, the solution works fine and two times it doesn't work. So either the radiologist will have an opinion on the solution that, okay, it's something which is trustworthy or would have a, uh, you know, uh, kind of mindset that it's not trustworthy. And in both cases, from a psychological perspective, you know, it may be detrimental. Now, why it can be detrimental? Because if the resident or the radiologist is not trusting the solution, right, then they while it is there, it is part of the system, but they are not trusting it. And, you know, and this is when I proposed to this uh, professor that I was uh, discussing, I proposed to them what Carpal is doing in India, and she was mighty impressed. And I told her that, okay, they, they don't confront the doctor with the AI decision. If the AI decision does not agree with the doctor, they present it to another doctor, and then the doctors sort it out among themselves. And these are very subtle you know, subtle changes in the processes. But if we make AI versus human, it's always going to create discomfort. But like Rohit also said, you know, we have uh, once in a while, a doctor doesn't like what the AI is saying. And then we take it to a panel. And it seems like these design of processes, how you 
build consensus is not very obvious. At least here in Europe, I have found that people are very worried about them. And it seems like from what Rohit has said and what I've learned from uh, uh, people at Carpel and other places, it seems like there is a lot of intellectual property being created in how these processes are being designed. So I would, I would really want to know from you guys that uh, it seems like there's a lot of effort in getting this uh, corner cases or edge cases where disagreement happens. If you can, uh, you know, maybe expand a bit more uh, on on that, how how are you dealing with this uh, disagreement uh, topic? You you mentioned it correctly. It's not AI versus NAD. No, I, I I don't think any company in existence, any AI company in existence, is uh, positioning themselves as AI versus NAD. Neither they are attempting to be, because uh, uh, as Dr. Vikas Singh sir also also said in the beginning, it's meant to be more of an assistant or augmentation kind of a tool rather than uh, you know that hey uh, this is correct or this is incorrect so what this means really is that the ai results results have to be objective will be objective in some sense but they are not deterministic so thinking of uh, uh, the ai results in form of in form of a deterministic context that if ai disagrees what will be the impact on patient health so that is probably not the right way of looking at it the right way of looking at it is that uh, again coming back uh, going back to what is the goal outcome uh, that you want your ai products to bring so if your goal is to improve the reading speed or re interpretation speed even if the results are uh, incorrect 10 percent 15 20 percent of time but they still say 80% of time of radiologists who are uh, reviewing uh, the exams. And, and, and that is the goal, uh, I think, uh, any, any tech product, uh, and specifically AI here in this context, should keep in mind what is the goal of their product and what is the intended use. And the second thing is uh, that you mentioned uh, that uh, 8 out of 10 times, if uh, a dad would see that AI is making right predictions, they would get comfortable and again make mistakes in two of these uh, two out of these 10 times yes that is very much possible again uh, not uh, it will it, it, uh, the weight of it is reduced a bit again uh, by not thinking it in a deterministic context because that's not actually what happens in clinic the radiologist just doesn't blindly agree or disagree they look for themselves but yes, that is correct. They have tendency to overlook things that uh, uh, in certain contexts, if they are comfortable with the interpretation of AI. And that is a hazard that all AI companies evaluate themselves upon. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, FDA uh, uh, is very much, uh, uh, is, is very much has a very uh, good laid out process for defining these hazards as to if radiologists become comfortable with your uh, system then what is the hazard of them making mistakes and how do you want counter that there and you have to lay down a process and follow that so that these hazards don't occur in real life and the higher your accuracy higher your hazards become because then the lower the time a radiologist will spend on those images reviewing them so uh, yes, uh, uh, I agree that there is a hazard, there is need to identify that. And then these processes, which are very thoroughly tested by FDA and CE, uh, set out benchmarks on how to deal with these situations. But yes, uh, one needs to read the uh, label and disclaimer and understand how to use this, these products effectively in a scenario and strictly follow those uh, guardrails that the company has given them. Yeah. yeah thanks, Dr. Cherian. Shraddha? Yes, absolutely. So I totally agree with both uh, Dr. Cherian and Sachin. Uh, it's, it's extremely important to test uh, the performance of these AI solutions against very solid ground truth. So that is what even Carpet is uh, enabling because we have the tools and the mechanisms uh, to test uh, the AI output against uh, a solid ground truth. And uh, moreover, uh, you know, if, if there is any disagreement, so it's not just a simple agree and disagree uh, that we allow the radiologist to uh, enter. It is more 
on rating of disagreement so you know these are the kind of uh, exhaustive uh, feedback uh, that we are trying to gather from the geologists and i think another very important factor when it comes to testing uh, ai solutions and identifying these hazards and conditions of use uh, prior to deployment is that uh, these these solutions they can't be tested on ad hoc geologists they need to be tested on scale and uh, i think that is uh, also a very important factor to be taken into consideration because it, at the end of the day it is uh, people's lives that uh, we are going to be putting at risk if these conditions of use and uh, you know possible failures and uh, wrongly uh, you know adopt uh, wrongly like placing any ai solution in the in, you know not taking into consideration factors such as demographics or uh, uh, geographies and uh, Uh, age groups genders so yes so uh, i think it it is not as straight forward as it sounds and uh, if we genuinely want to derive a clinical value from ai solutions so uh, testing mechanisms need to be very very robust and uh, on point thank you uh, thanks for that and uh, uh, i think i would just uh, probably now conclude and, and there are 3 minutes left maybe Dr. Singh would like to also add, but I would like to add a one more positive dimension that I have discovered. So there was a, a Norwegian researcher uh, who was collaborating with Danish uh, clinicians, and they were analyzing ECG data, and then they recognized new features which were not aware uh, or uh, known to the medical domain. that they could look at those features from an ai perspective and know that whether this ecg is a female patient or is a male patient and then after you know this collaboration between ai experts and the clinicians they ended up creating new medical knowledge and to me that's a good silver lining because uh, of course you know we all want to bring efficiency by using technology but i think what i see increasingly with the big companies making announcements i was listening to nvidia recently so now they are deploying ai for science and ai for science for me you know it's much more than money and productivity because it's 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 knowing what we don't know and there is a lot more that we don't know than what we know so i hope uh, that uh, both of you and also rohit uh, i mean not just enable productivity but also create new knowledge uh, and i think there is potential because ai is able to see uh, you know multi dimensional features which humans uh, are are missing but i think there again lies the challenge of explaining because science is not just uh, you know understanding the how but also the what part of it and uh, yeah so over from my side i think dr singh if you would like to add something here uh thank you sachin and all the panelists i think i have at least benefited in all the participants who have taken uh, to this session uh the ai is a new thinking and it is had to go but i still have to say that please remember this is a tool to help the medical people it is cannot replace the medic medicine medical people or the doctors etc sachin have been conducting lot of training for the doctors on artificial intelligence or cyber security along with the phfi even the government was quite keen at the prayer and sachin has developed and has been doing it i i was wondering on a lighter note that uh, we you know they, there are two kind of uh, people who are amalgamating their knowledge and one is the technology people like such in and rohit and other are the medical people like myself and cherian the difference is right from the training day one we are taught how to dress up how to talk to the patient while uh, that's why today also probably both of us are in white t-shirt with the collar and the all the ai people or technology people are on the round black t-shirts because they can put on short they can put on whatever but uh, the the jeans with the neat uh, something done etc but uh, then the you see we are told that a patient will not appreciate if this kind of a dress you go 
I say I am a doctor and I want to examine. They'll feel probably poor opinion that I'm in wrong hands. So they'll take long time to amalgamate, etc. And the pandemic has taught us a lot of good things as well. And it has created a lot of good solutions. I would also just in the end like to say the confidence in our people, the amount of enormous data we have, because some of our state have more population than the, any other country in the world. So the kind of uh, the disease pattern which you have, like tuberculosis, you will never have this kind of data anywhere in the world what we have now share in the country. I was a little aghast, and I think that the fact also, very senior functionary of IBM told me that we were doing something along with the Manipal hospital, but somehow we had to drop it out. He said, introductory when I went around to look up what hospital looks like, what data looks like, which people are talking of monetizing the data uh, because you can make money. Similarly, he said, when I asked somebody who is in charge of the data, and he said very innocently and politely, Sir, what are you looking for? Tell me the, what you want. I'll create everything and give you to by tomorrow. That means data will be fudged and will be given. The reliability of the data is still a big question mark. Uh, we have seen it, and that is no doubt about it, that this need to be really taken care of. Once again, I thank you very much, all of you, and also Sajin to conduct the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And thanks to uh, Dr. Cherian and Shraddha both. Thanks for your valuable time and thanks for everyone who participated. Hopefully the recorded session uh, would be a good reference for the future. And we look forward to continue this kind of uh, discussion which can add value to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sachin. Thank you, everybody.